So I'm here with my friend, Chris Mulder. It's Chuck Charlton here. And uh, we reconnected recently uh, after a very long time. We've known each other probably for 15 years, but I would say it's been at least a decade since we've had a conversation. So yeah. we're April 2020. We've got the uh, this whole self-isolation thing going on. So what better time to have a conversation than right now? And uh, so, Chris, can you introduce yourself uh, for anybody watching? And I'll do the same. And, you know, we'll do, the topic for today is really about private mortgages. I was interested, I guess, from a professional standpoint and also just as, as a regular consumer would be. So I'm kind of playing the everyman when I ask you these questions. But why don't you take a second just to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks very much, Chuck, uh, for that introduction. And um, my name is Christopher Mulder. I am principal broker and second generation owner of Tridac Mortgage. Uh, it's a family business that my father founded on the Danforth back in 1977. And simply put, what my job is, I have the title of principal broker, mortgage broker, but simply put, my job, my role is to connect people who need money with the people who have money. Simply put, that's, that's really what it is that I do. Uh, I rely on multiple tools um, in order to achieve that for clients. And one of those tools is private mortgages. So that's what we'll delve into here. But um, you can find me well, on social media, if you just Google Tridoc Mortgage, you'll find it, or Chris Mulder. But uh, I look forward to this chat with you, Chuck. Yeah, good. I, I Well, let's approach it from that angle first. So somebody who needs money, and then we'll talk about the money providing side. But someone who needs money, what are the typical scenarios that you see? I mean, I th the most common that I see is somebody who you know, is maybe, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years into their mortgage, they have something rough that happens, they lose their job. Maybe it's even something like this, this whole, uh, yes. you know, self-isolation yeah, and COVID. Very and, timely. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and I don't know if we'll, when we'll release this video, but I think that it's, it's very timely right now in a sense that we're living in times that we haven't seen before. But that's someone who, can you give some examples of maybe some people that, that run into those situations and why they would maybe need a private mortgage or private funds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, high level, let's take a, a step back. The way I like to explain the Canadian landscape for mortgages is divided up into three different buckets. You have your A bucket, your B bucket, and your C bucket. Everybody would like to be in the A bucket, which is your A type lenders, banks, uh, monoline lenders, where you find the most, uh, with the lowest rates, most favorable terms and conditions. But the reality is, is that the, uh, the, the sandbox that those lenders like to operate in is very limited. Then the B bucket uh, are more progressive lenders that uh, we would call B or Alt A lenders, um, the largest of which uh, names that people know are Home Trust, uh, Equitable Bank. Um, and they really have designed products that are suitable for individuals who maybe don't meet all the criteria of A, but still have strong underlying uh, characteristics on their application. So money is made available to them. Uh, case in point are individuals who are self-employed or maybe have had past issues with their credit. And then the C bucket is where individuals who uh, are really struggling but own real estate would find uh, su suitable solutions. So examples uh, are anybody who um, is having issues with income where perhaps there's a personal circumstance um, whether it's health related or this example of COVID-19 and the outbreak where job, jobs have been lost, income isn't coming in. Yeah, we're talking about mortgage deferral, but guess what? All those mortgage deferrals are going to have to be paid one day. That There will be a day of reckoning. So how no do you get lunches. caught up? Yeah, no free <laughs> right, lunches, no, definitely sure. not. Yeah. So I think, I think we're going to see a proliferation of, I mean, that's probably a really tangible example for anybody watching this as to where a private lender might get involved. Uh, because uh, Chuck, you might be able to speak to this and where real estate values are headed, but hopefully uh, values will hold. People will have lots of equity built up in their homes. Um, 
A lenders, B lenders aren't going to allow you to access that very easily. C lenders are going to be much more flexible to create liquidity and give people the opportunity to get caught up. Right. So I think that's a good example. And then there are any any number of, of uh, issues, whether it's uh, tax arrears, we commonly will help uh, self-employed individuals get up caught up with tax arrears, um, debt consolidation, sometimes debt just gets out of hand, consolidated all before we take it back to a B or a C lender. And it should be noted that um, private mortgage lending from a borrower's point of view is never their first choice, right? We're trying to solve problems uh, and it's expensive money. So any decision made to borrow money through a private lender should have a very clear exit strategy attached to it, right? right? It should be helping you to progress to get from point A to point B. Right, uh, it's that's a one thing I think to is, try and move yeah. up the chain, right? Exactly, <laughs> to borrow money just for the sake of borrowing money it's just a recipe for disaster and we'll get people into more, more trouble. Uh, and that's where the guidance and advice really comes in from a good, good broker, whoever's providing that money for the borrower. It's uh, it's interesting because when you need money, it's like no one wants to give it to you, right? It's yeah. when you don't My, need the money, everyone is just, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy to get, right? Yeah, Chuck, uh, I mean, I, one of it, I, I use this all the time with, with my clients uh, on client calls. I quote Mark Twain. Mark Twain wrote in one of his books, a banker is somebody who gives you an umbrella when it's sunny and asks for it back the moment it starts to rain. Oh so it's boy. just, it, it's, it's in literature that that is fact. <laughs> Mark Twain's had a couple of good ones like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it, so we've talked about the, the, the target market of who might need that product. Now, if we switch over and, and talk about it as far as, uh, providing money. So you've told me that you have a, a pool of money, right? So there's, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about what you have as far as a resource for those people? And then who might, um, if somebody's interested in maybe being a part of that, uh, we've talked about some different ways that they can do that. They can either channel their money towards one opportunity or towards kind of that shared pool of resources as a shareholder. So just hoping to kind of learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely, Chuck. And before we begin a conversation about mortgage investments, uh, I do have to pause the conversation to just highlight and make sure that we're making the regulators happy, uh, that this is not a, an advice conversation. <laughs> this is simply uh, sharing of information. So no way, shape or form am I soliciting or recommending mortgage investment as with everything, you should consult with a professional to get legal and tax advice. How does that's that sound? Does good. it sound official? That's, that's like the mortgage bed? industry version of the Miranda <laughs> rights. You know what I mean? So, that's but, right. it's, but it is important. I, I mean, I I, uh, I started this call and, and came up with this idea because it's something I've always been interested in. Obviously, I'm closer to it than most people because I'm in the real estate industry. But right. it, it is something where I've heard people talk about it. I've had colleagues that have loan money uh, for private yeah. mortgages. Uh, I've had clients that have done the same. And and I thought, let me just learn, go deeper in my knowledge, uh, or yes. at least cover the basis to say, okay, do I know as much as I think I do, <laughs> right? But <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I just kind of, I'm, I'm approaching it with an open mind and, I, and I'm trying to, to speak through the voice of everyone else. I asked my team, I said, what do you guys want to know about private mortgages. And, and even within yeah. our industry, there's still questions to be asked, which means obviously, you know, the general public is going to want to know this stuff even more than us. Yeah, absolutely, Chuck. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to delve into that a little bit to, to give you an idea of, of what that landscape looks like. Um, so for this conversation, there are two, really two fundamental ways that uh, individuals can participate in uh, mortgage investments. The first way is direct investment, where they themselves would be lending the money and their name, whether it's in a, in a corporation that they own, a holding company, or in their personal name, whatever structure that looks like, will be uh, named as the mortgagee, 
mortgagee is the lender, right? Mortgagor is borrower, mortgagee is lender. So and this is usually the, a second mortgage just to qualify, right? It, it doesn't yeah. have to be. It okay. can be so it any, could be a primary. Any, yeah, yeah, that's right. Could be primary, could be a first mortgage, could be a second mortgage. Uh, but the key thing is, is that under, and this is the traditional way that private mortgage investments are managed or handled. Um, so the individual, you know, let's say it's Mr. Mrs. Smith, uh, Mrs. Smith comes along, she has $100,000, she can participate as Mrs. Smith in, uh, uh, in lending money, and her name would be named, uh, if you look at the title of the property, she would be named as a first mortgagee, second mortgagee, uh, and that means that she can enforce it, okay? Um, the second way would be to participate in a corporation that has a portfolio of mortgages, most common structure is something called a MIC or a mortgage investment corporation. And so when we're talking about mix, now we're talking about securities, right? You're buying actual shares. And that's another conversation when we start talking about securities, which we can uh, touch upon as well. Okay. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to the first way, let's call it direct investing. Um, there are different structures. You can invest as uh, one investor, or we have something called s syndicated mortgages, where a group of individuals can get together and syndicate a mortgage. So for example, Chuck, let's say um, I come to you with an opportunity. We need $200,000 to lend out to a potential borrower. I don't have 200. You don't have 200, but together we might have 100 each if we're lucky. Um, we can syndicate that mortgage as one second mortgage owned 50-50 between Chuck and Chris. Uh, and that would be uh, secured against the real estate and we would then receive payment from there. Okay, so that would be considered a partnership under, under the law? Correct. It would, well, not a partnership under the law, but what we call the specific language is a syndicated mortgage. Okay. And then what would happen? So let's say I passed away. Now, how does that work as far as, I guess my estate owns that? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So the estate would own it. It is, you know, on, from your point of view, a mortgage is an asset. So the same way a, a bank uh, from a bank's point of view, a mortgage on your property is an asset on their balance sheet. Similarly, uh, you as a private mortgage uh, investor, uh, it would be about an asset on your balance sheet. And typically each month you would receive uh, some form of payment from the borrower. Gotcha. Okay. So it is really like buying a you know, like a, a stock, let's say, in, in that sense, how it's treated as your, from your estate. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. So it is it is your assets. And um, so a couple of things when we're talking about direct investment that way, um, yin and yang, pros and cons, right? So the pros are that it generates monthly cash flow. So just like any other mortgage that you have with a bank, usually it's set up with very specific terms and conditions, in, including the interest rate, the repayment terms, early payout penalties, maturity date, all these things. So we structure that that private mortgage uh, like any other mortgage and um, monthly payments are, are made to you. So very simply, it can be as simple as a, a post-dated check. So on the first of the month, a check will be made out to Chuck. It might be just the interest portion, right? Very often private mortgages are, because they're short term, we usually do interest only payments. Uh, and so you'll receive a, an interest payment each month. And um, that, of course, counts towards your income, right? You, you have to claim that as, as interest income uh, when you do your year-end taxes. And, um, but it's, it's as simple as that, as linear as that. It's, it's not more complicated. Um, the challenge with uh, private investing this way is that now you've got all your eggs in one basket. And if the borrower cannot make payment, and now is a great example, many people have given money to, through private mortgages, uh, the COVID outbreak has hit and borrowers are not able to make their payments anymore. So what are you gonna do as the investor, right? Just like the bank, you might defer payment, you might accrue interest, 
um, that's, that's really your decision and it rests on you. It's the risk that you're taking on as a private investor um, to deal with non-payment. And so what, what are the options? That the, first of all, let's, let's talk about term. What's the most common term that you see these private yeah. mortgages? I mean, a first yes. is different. It's probably going to have a longer term, but uh, let's Correct. say a second. What do you typically see? Yeah. So on second mortgages, uh, traditionally, it's anywhere between six to 12 months. So short term. The, uh, I always kind of joke, you know, anybody can put out money. That's the easy part. It's getting the money back. That's hard. It's, mm-hmm. You've only been successful if you get your money back. And so typically we like to roll it over six to 12 months. And similar to the conversation from the borrower's point of view that you want to have an exit strategy in place, um, prudent decision making from an investor's point of view is making sure that there is some form of exit strategy before you get into it. And what, what would right. that mean? So so six to 12 months, you're looking at, I, I guess a common thing that, that investors would look at is how much money is left in the house. So the equity position is one of them. What yeah. else would so, you look at? I'm now screening an opportunity in front of me. What, yeah. what am I looking at as a, as a responsible investor? Yeah, so uh, as a responsible investor, uh, the decision is driven primarily or a large one of the biggest cornerstones is equity position, right? So um, generally we don't, in in the GTA, 75% would probably be a comfortable maximum recommended. Um, Some lenders may be comfortable going up to 80% loan to value. Uh, You certainly shouldn't consider, there's nothing restricting you, but I wouldn't recommend going over 80% loan to value, right? right? And we, you know, we'll get an appraisal to confirm that valuation. But the lower the loan to value, generally the safer the mortgage should be, the mortgage investment. So that's number one. But then you want to take a really common sense approach to it, um, knowing what the borrower situation is, what that personal covenant looks like from a borrower. You know, what what, uh, likelihood, what capacity do they have to make mortgage payments? Um, Is it helping them move forward? and taking a very pragmatic approach. Um, So typical examples, two of the most common exit strategies would be either A, you're providing financing for somebody to bridge a timing gap where um, they know they're gonna have to sell their home. So it happens often with elderly uh, borrowers, maybe they need to reno the property so that it looks better and you can do your job as a realtor, Chuck, sure, to, or put to list it and get into top it value. and get a hundred, yeah. you know, more on the yeah. sale price, those kind of things. Yeah. Right. So that, that's a possible scenario. And that looks really good because you as an investor know that you're putting money in, uh, it's secured. And then there is a, a defined exit strategy that they will sell the property to, so you can recover your money and they can repay you. Um, then the other most common scenario is helping somebody who has fallen on hard times consolidate debt together. So that way their credit score doesn't slide, right? If, if borrowers are, are in trouble, ined- inevitably their credit scores will slide, which has a whole domino effect because then you can't walk into a bank to get, uh, get a consolidation mortgage, et cetera. So what's ha- again, coming back to COVID-19, um, we may have borrowers who are running into trouble with their credit cards, right? If you have to choose between paying your mortgage and taxes versus a credit card, I think credit card takes lowest priority. So credit scores are going to fall. And then once this all clears up a year from now, people are going to have damaged credit. So how are we going to consolidate their mortgages together to get them to move forward? So great opportunity there might be to help them with a second mortgage tidy everything up, the credit score recovers, and then they can go back to the bank and, and refinance. So it's kind of a, a two-step dance. So those are two common examples okay. where you might see exit strategies, yeah. Okay. A- okay. And helping with assessment, yeah. So six to 12 months, is, are, there, are there any longer than that? Do they ever go two, three years? Like, or it depends on the yeah. situation? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, just the same way that um, individuals come in every different shape and size, we might have different tastes in music, uh, different different ways that we dress. 
uh, private investors are no different. There are some private investors who are happy to park their money long term and not want to deal with the constant administration. Right. And so there might be investors who are looking for very safe first mortgage positions and they're happy to commit for five years earning six, seven percent. Right. Sure. So uh, let's, which is possible. Let's talk about that percentage, too. So I heard you talk about an, an appraisal and there's there's going to be probably a lawyer involved. Yes. That's typically costs that are picked up by the borrower, I guess, in most cases. That's like they will they'll cover that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the borrower pays all the expenses for the administration and setup, uh, which include legal fees, uh, appraisal. Um, and those are the two most common ones. And I, sh I should note that uh, when it comes to private mortgages, uh, Law Society requires that for private mortgages over $50,000, um, there is a requirement for two lawyers to be involved, one to represent the interest of the borrower and one to represent the interest of the lender. And so typically the borrower pays for both via the, the, the funds themselves. You know, very often we just deduct from the mortgage advance uh, okay. the fees from there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, is there anything else to add about that? Like, I think um, we've covered a lot of information about option one, about investing directly. Mm -hmm. um, maybe as we transition to option two is the shareholding. What are mm -hmm. the pros and cons of each? Like, why would you talked about how all your eggs are in one basket? Right. Uh, so you want to be, I guess, very selective as far as what your criteria. You just said there's all kinds of flavor. I think for mm -hmm. the most part, is it fair to say that the the interest rate that somebody uh, is going to pay is going to reflect the risk? So there's probably higher risk clients and there's a lower risk. You talked That's about right. how the closer you get, like the less equity in the house, the more risk there is uh, to, to the lender of that money. Uh, so Correct. the rate probably goes up from there. Like I think there's probably people yeah. that might even go to 15 or 10% uh, equity. Yes. I know that they're out there. And I mean, it's yeah. at, at that point, the rates really start to, to crank up high is my understanding. Yeah, definitely. Um, generally speaking for second mortgages, um, if you're 65% loan to value or lower, uh, depending on the quality of the borrower, you're looking at nine to 10% interest rates. Um, as you start to approach 75% loan to value, uh, or higher, you're getting to the 10 to 12% interest rate range, typ typical pricing. And then uh, other than the legal fees and appraisal fees, uh, brokers will definitely charge a fee anywhere from uh, usually one to 2%. And occasionally lenders will charge a fee on that as well, anywhere from one to 2%. Uh, and again, depends on, on the flavor, the risk profile, um, you know, what those fees look like. So that, and this is why you say this is like a C option for people because it really does add up all those expenses for the borrower. It's like I want twenty thousand. It's probably going to cost me ten to get that out. You know, it's definitely, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So, and you know, there's been um, I've been doing this with my dad, as you know, for you know, I'm I'm going on to fifteen years of my career, uh, and we were, you know, when we were doing. Um, private mortgages 15 years ago, it was very fringe. You know, it was a very niche uh, thing that we were doing. But in the last, let's call it three to four years, there's been a complete proliferation of private money in the marketplace. Uh, a lot of brokers are now much more comfortable doing it and selling it. Um, and so it, that, that was driven by, it's a, a balloon effect, right? We know that the government stepped in to make, uh, restrictions on mortgage borrowing. And so as they squeezed one area, another, another area of the balloon expanded and that was the private money. So right. due to the squeeze, they thought they were doing good and now, yeah, money's available, but it's a lot more expensive because it's more niche. I feel like we're on the brink of this becoming much more of a, a normal conversation for people is that they, that, that, you know, to see the full breadth of options versus just, oh, well, I don't qualify for A, well, then I'm out of yeah. luck, right? I mean, that's the way it used to be. I mean, 50, 60 years ago, you go into the bank, yeah. if they didn't say yes, oh, well, I guess the answer is 
I can't yeah. do anything. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that it's becoming uh, less taboo. I mean, I've even seen it in our industry. It was almost mm -hmm. seen as somewhat predatory back in the days, yes. right? It, it was yeah. very much that effect where the mm -hmm. bad guy was the lender and the good guy, the yeah. poor guy that needed help. And, and I yeah. mean, it, there, there's still an element there where we talked about it is it is expensive for the borrower, but it fulfills a need that just can't be met anywhere else in a, in what I consider to be a very socially responsible way. I mean, you need help, yeah. you need help. It's as simple as that. I, and I think that's really the key. And, and I see a lot happening in the industry and in the mortgage industry where money is just being thrown out there um, in a very aggressive, irresponsible manner. And uh, I think for anybody listening to this who has an interest in, in private mortgages, um, it, it, careful who is re making the recommendation to you um, that you're getting the full picture because I've seen some very scary things where I just shake my head and say that, that makes no sense, that is reckless. Right. So yeah, I think your, your point is, is rings very true, Chuck. Now, what would be the minimum investment somebody would make? Like what's the smallest, uh, let's say, you know, second mortgage you've ever seen someone do or third or what, like if they were going to yeah. do uh, option one, investing directly, what, yeah. what, what would be the, the kind of minimum effective dose that somebody would have to inject as far as capital? Yeah. I mean, that the answer to that is very linear because it's, it depends on the need of the borrower. Okay. So I myself as a broker may come to you and say, well, I've got, got somebody who's only needing $20,000. Um, and so I've done mortgages for fifteen to $20,000 as a second mortgage, right? right. Okay. Um, the, friction, the setup costs are very expensive from the borrower's point of view, but sometimes it just needs to be done. Um, and then from there, it, it goes up and it, it really is a linear relationship based on what the need is that day and what you have um, and often with a, a broker. So the bridge between the private lender and the, the private mortgage borrower is a broker. That's, that's who is facilitating these transactions. So it's a question of knowing a broker that, um, that can find what you're looking for. Right. right. And, uh, and also I should mention, you know, it's the role of the broker to ensure that there's suitability there you know, first of all, KYC, so know your client, and then suitability to make sure that a private mortgage investment is suitable for you uh, as, a, as an individual, right, as an investor. Right. Because if, Chuck, you come to me and you say, well, I've got 25000 but I have plans for it next year, 12 months, I need that money back because of X, Y, Z, then it's, it's not suitable for you, right? right. This right. has got to be long-term long -term view and it's, it's got to be suitable. Because there are risks, and I think you asked me about those risks, and we can get into that. Yeah, for sure. But, um, I'm sure the risk is, is again, <laughs> reflective on what level of equity position is there and also the exit strategy like we talked about. Uh, yeah. So let's look at option two as, as you could purchase shares. I would imagine the investment there would be a little more flexible as well, really. Yeah, and so I think overarching the two different ways of investing in, in private mortgages is um, option A that we've discussed, direct investment, all your eggs are in one basket. So if the borrower doesn't pay, you're in trouble. Option B, you're now buying shares in a corporation that invests in a portfolio of mortgages that's typically professionally managed on your behalf. And so that means that you are not, now all the risk is in, in one specific product, uh, property, but in the portfolio. And so now you're spreading risk and that's, that's no different than the concept of a mutual fund, right? So you're, you're buying this basket of mortgages. And so fundamentally that's what option uh, uh, B looks like, the, the uh, mortgage investment corporation option. And that's where the benefit lies is that you're, you're spreading that portfolio and you as an individual investor, you're not having to make the decision whether you invest or not. And if payment is not made, you're not having to enforce uh, that mortgage. It's all being done professionally for you. Right. And there's a set kind of <laughs> default rate. It becomes, it's almost, <clears throat> excuse me, it's almost like insurance where there's, you know, there's a risk tolerance level for that, 
that portfolio. You would say, okay, we're going to try and hit, you know, 70% loan to value, right? So that the clients within there keep a certain equity position. That's right. So the portfolio, there are some mix that maybe only specialize in commercial properties. There are mix that specialize only in second, uh, some in only rural properties. So each mix will have a different profile associated with it. And, um, and you're absolutely right about that. And there'll be different guidelines set up to, so that all the mortgages in that portfolio should have similar underlying characteristics. Now, would you find in general, um, what kind of rates would somebody expect from, from something like that, getting involved? I, I know it's, the answer is going to depend on what kind of mix it is. Right. But yeah. it, it, if you were to kind of put goalposts on the high and low of yeah. what you typically see. Yeah. So um, when it comes to, to the rates of return, so one thing to keep in mind is that the mix are a, a very specific entity, which are defined in the Income Tax Act. So if you want to look for information about mortgage investment corporations, it's actually a chapter in the Act. And um, what's unique about mix is that they're structured as a corporation. Um, when the, the revenue for the corporation is interest income, right? You're constantly getting interest each month from the portfolio of mortgages. Um, and after expenses for management, legal, whatever the operating costs are of the MIC, the corporation is not permitted to have a profit to hold revenue. So all of the revenue, uh, net revenue, essentially has to be distributed to the investors via dividend. And so um, to circle back to your original question of, as to what uh, returns can look like, um, most mix that I'm seeing are operating anywhere from the 7% to 10% range uh, is, is what we typically see. Yeah. As it, and this is now dividend income. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, and that, yep. Would you say overall yep, that's, that's generally a little bit less? Well, again, it comes back to what you're choosing. I was going to say, is that less than mm-hmm. you'd find in the, you know, the, the just channeled towards one certain thing? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you can yeah. find that you'll still get seven to 10% if you, if you become just kind of the sole owner of that, that uh, mortgage. I forget what we called it, investing directly. Yeah. Direct investing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it, you can perhaps get a higher rate of return, but then the risk is much higher as well, right? So it's right. It again this risk, risk and uh, and reward yeah. um, for the average person. Do they want to be? You know, this is this is a very you and I might be comfortable with real estate, um, but for some people, managing and knowing what debtor creditor uh, obligations look like, they may not have the appetite for that. So this is where the mortgage investment corporation can make sense for people. And plus, if there's a problem with the direct way of doing it, you're, that's a very stressful situation if, if the money's not coming Definitely. back versus this pool. I would say if somebody's trying to decide which one to do, it's the fact that the headaches are probably a lot less. Like you're paying a manager yeah. but it's <clears throat> or a management fee, but it's also so that you don't need to lie awake at night worrying about problems when they show that's up. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you have to go power of sale because of non-payment, when you're direct investment investing, you're showing up there. It's you who's who's there with the sheriff uh, on the day of reckoning to change the locks. Right. Right. Uh, whereas when it's handled through the MIC, um, you, you know that that happens all behind the scenes and and gets reported back. Right. <clears throat> right. But it becomes almost kind of predictable from a math standpoint as far as how often that should happen based on you know, kind of the, the guiding vision for the, the MIC and what they're trying to do. Right. Yeah. 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 Barring any black swan events, like what we're experiencing, (laughs) what we're experiencing now, but the, the underlying portfolio again is in that decision-making who you're lending to ensuring that they can continue to pay. Um, And similar to, to banks, you know, just as an aside, a, a general comment, similar to banks, um, you know, the banks are deferring mortgage payments, but the interest continues to accumulate. So if a MIC is deferring mortgage payments, that interest is still due, and eventually that money will be repaid. It just might not happen. The cash flow might not be here this month, but it may show up 12 months from now, right? Right, right. Uh, 
I, I want to talk about two more things. The the, the first one is about uh, can somebody use money in, from their registered, uh, the RSP, towards either one of these options? Um, the answer to this is yes. Uh, for direct investing, it's very, very niche. There are few trustees, right? You need a um, an RRSP trustee that knows that side of the business. It's quite onerous. It's quite different. Um, there are a few out on the West Coast that are more progress progressive. Uh, they would be Community Trust and Olympia Trust are the two trustees that, that do manage that. Um, when it comes to MIX, um, yes, MIX are RRSP, TFSA, uh, eligible RESP. Um, so they are defined as such under the Income Tax Act. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my last question is just uh, somebody comes to you, let's say, with, let, let's just say they have $100,000, right? They're fortunate mm -hmm. to be in that position. Uh, yep. Their decision is whether or not to purchase real estate, you know, leverage that 100000 to maybe buy a mm -hmm. four or $500,000 uh, property. Mm -hmm or get into either option one or two of direct or the, the yeah. MIC. What's your advice to that, that customer? Yeah, that's, that's a, a tricky one. It really depends on your investment um, appetite. Um, you know, when you're dealing with mortgage investments, the upside may not be as dramatic as with real estate especially if we're talking about GTA real estate, right? Well, it's not um, as leveraged, right? It's kind that's of right. dollar for dollar mm -hmm. versus I'm putting a dollar in when I buy a property and I get four or Correct. five times, right? Yeah, that's right. And the, so it's not as leveraged. The direct, uh, the mortgage investment is going to generate cash flow for you, right? So $100,000, if you are fortunate enough to lend it out at, well, at ten percent, it's eight hundred thirty-three dollars per month that would you would generate for cash flow point of view. Um, if you're looking at a hundred thousand dollars in an investment in real estate, are you going to be able to generate true cash flow of eight hundred thirty-three dollars a month uh, based on rents and leveraging costs and all these things? I I don't think so. I've I've run these numbers personally, Chuck. You may comment a little bit further on it. But it's generally, you know, unless you have a large down payment, the carrying costs are quite high, right? Uh, by the time it's all said and done. Right. So, um, so did you, but what you get when you own real estate is the upside of an asset that is appreciating, right? Your capital is appreciating. Whereas with a mortgage investment, it, your capital is not appreciating. Uh, it's just generating income. So they're very different classes of, of assets or, or investments, if you right. will. And it's good. I mean, to to kind of split them off and maybe do you know something here, something there. It's having that sure. balanced portfolio too. But yeah, that's a good comparison because because that is yeah. something I get investors that come to see us and they're concerned about you know managing tenants or especially now. I mean, you can see tenants not paying. That's another issue we're seeing yeah. in Huge. March, April, twenty twenty. <clears throat> is this this kind of tenant strike that's happening? And we've mm -hmm. seen uh, this erosion of, of landlord rights from their perspective. Um, yeah. You know, tenants probably don't feel like that's the case. But uh, right. the point is, is, is like what's going to help you sleep at night and what's going to give you the kind of uh, return and, you know, and, and uh, I, I guess, you know, real estate's a good wealth builder, but you're right. It's not going to get you that cash flow that, that you were talking about. So yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, and further to that also, in that vein, I mean, it's a it's an efficiency product as well because you can't hold, for example, real estate in your RRSP, um, but you can hold the mixed shares in your RRSP, for example, right? right. So there's a, a, an efficiency aspect to it, um, which makes it quite quite different. So it really depends on what somebody's looking for. So as far as access to mix, like, are, are you like, it, is it up to you to kind of have that directory to say, these are the ones that I'm aware of, or does that happen? Who, who yeah. does somebody source that information through? Yeah, there, um, there are mix associations, for example, the Ontario mix association on Omica, um, which is a resource. But the one thing to understand about mix is that <clears throat> 
most mix, uh, we have to talk about investment in general, right? Um, in the investment world, the regulator divides it between two different markets. There's the public market and the private investment market. The public market is what we know in the, for example, stock markets. Uh, these are everyday investments that have a broad marketplace and easy to purchase. And they have something called a prospectus, which is a very onerous um, disclosure document, which permits them uh, from the regulator's point of view to sell to, the, to anybody in the public, okay? Mix are what we would consider to be in the private space. And so they are uh, what we call part of the exempt market, okay? And so the exempt market is exempt from what? It's exempt from the prospectus requirement. And this conversation can go quite deep, but there are any number of um, criteria under which an investor might be categorized to permit them to invest into a MIC. Um, some, of the, some of the biggest criteria would be whether they're an accredited investor, a qualified investor, uh, or they can invest under what's known as friends, family, and close business associates as well. So there are different types of um, categories under which somebody can invest in private companies like this. Right. And so that trade or that transaction is facilitated by a party called an exempt market dealer. And so um, the, the best way to come back to your question about how to get information, um, looking at the MIC associations, doing, doing a Google search, uh, and that information's out there. You'll find a lot of MICs are looking to raise capital. Um, I know of a few and, um, you know, there is information that's out there. Okay. So your role in the process is you can facilitate, you mentioned about the Invest Direct, is that you really become the bridge there to make sure it's a win-win. <clears throat> and then on the mix side, I'm hearing that you might be able to point someone in the right direction, but it's, it's maybe not something you're directly involved in the same way. Correct. Yeah. To, to properly assess the qualifications or the suitability of a MIC investment into a, a MIC, uh, the, tri the uh, role is somebody who holds an exempt market dealer's license or who is an exempt market dealer, I should say, um, because now we're dealing with securities, right? Buying and, and selling of uh, shares. And so that is done through an exempt market dealer which is like a, a financial advisor. It's a very specific license that permits somebody to do that. Okay. And that's that you can connect somebody. So if, if you became the channel that somebody had a conversation around this, you could say, okay, this yes. is where to go, or these are two or three options of, of people to speak. Yes. With. Strictly yeah. for, again, to, <laughs> to make the regulators happy. The only people qualified to talk about, uh, about the suitability of different mortgage investments would be the exempt market dealer. Good. And so that, that is really, I can certainly happy to chat with anybody who has an interest yeah. uh, to put them on, you know, as a friend of Chuck, uh, certainly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Is there anything else we didn't talk about that you think is probably worth uh, discussing around, around private mortgages? No, I think the it's a, it's an exciting space. Um, I think it's it's reached a tipping point. There's a lot of conversation and opportunity out there. I do believe the future um, with COVID nineteen, unfortunately, um, there will be many opportunity. You know, private sorry, many borrowers who are going to need private financing because they're going to have properties and homes that are have equity. Um, but their cash flow has been affected one way or another through this financial crisis. Yeah. So I think it's it's timely, uh, but again, it's not for everybody. And really, it's important to assess each individual situation to make sure that it's right for you, makes sense, and that you start with the end, <laughs> start with your exit strategy, uh, both from the borrower's point of view and the investor's point of view. Right. I think what we're seeing now is that it's like there's a lot of square pegs and there's a lot of round holes, right? Like it's just there's, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just a lot of uh, non-traditional things happening out there, not only as a result of what's happening in, you know, spring 2020, but just overall, it's it's more self-employed people. 
uh, different. All yeah, of it. I mean, new to Canada. I mean, the the our economy has done so well partly because of really how many people were welcoming into the country too, and so that's that's another channel that typically doesn't fit into the A category of. Uh, that's of right. Lending, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's good opportunity. It's just um, yeah, there, there's a real need for it, and um, you know, connecting to the right people is step one. Good. So uh, just to to wrap up. How can somebody get a hold of you? Phone, email. How do you prefer somebody reach out yeah. to you? Um, uh, the, the best way is on my website, tridacmortgages.com. I have a calendar directly on there, a booking calendar. So if somebody visits the website, you can book a call directly into my calendar, informs me, uh, and that's the easiest way. And of course, my email address is there. You can call me. Uh, but if somebody really wanted to have a discussion, just use that calendar booking comes right into my calendar and uh, makes it very easy for all parties. So that way we can connect the most efficient way possible. Well, that sounds great. Very easy. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to make it so. Thank you for your time. It's, uh, I mean, we've got uh, just a, a wonderful resource here uh, for anybody that needs it. Uh, I guess both as a, a, as a lender and a borrower, I guess, is that you're there to answer any questions anyone has. Correct. Again, going back to my introduction, my job, simply put, is to connect people who need money with the people who have money. Uh, I solve hard money problems. That's what I do. I enjoy doing it. Good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much, Chuck. Real pleasure to connect with you again. 